Good evening, Bill. Good evening, Sandy. How are you? I'm fine. <laughs> I, want to, I want to Photoshop out that uh, switch light switch behind you. Why? Something wrong with my light switch. Stop being it's so a very nice light switch. Just breaking up the composition. That's all. Um, traditional digital. Okay. I don't know what that means, but I will take it. Mm. Where do you think the tipping point has been the, the the most significant tipping point between something that we might consider to be traditional art and something that we consider to be, I suppose, modern or contemporary art? What do you think the watershed moment was in the history of art where the greatest change has occurred? A good question. Um I think the answer would probably be somewhere around the explosion of the internet in the late nineties, just because wow. of the availability of people seeing stuff. Okay. Um, but I mean, I don't know, Andy Warhol playing with a Mac, you know, like mm. in the eighties. Mm. It's, it's interesting because just because something is digital or analog, that distinction is less of a separation to me than if someone is using what I would consider traditional analog craft just within a digital domain, if somebody's painting with brushes, it's just that they're digital brushes in Procreate or whatever it is, mm. that to me is much more like than someone who is, say, doing generative art or something like that, you know what I mean? Which yeah. I think is actually more of a separation. So for me, I think you know, even further back, we say like the birth of photography also obviously sure. made a massive impact on how art has changed, like the permutations of art, I guess, became in, broader. In, in photography, I would say it wasn't even digital photography in, in the modern sense, but I would say it was even like the smartphone mm. is when it really changed, you know? Yeah. And well... I'm looking at Hockney, first of all, a bigger splash, sure. 1967. I like that painting. Yeah. Uh, the thing that I like about this painting is that it does freeze a moment in a way that's actually very sort of photographic. And in 1967, yep. although this is kind of post-futurism, it's definitely pop art, uh, we're looking at something that really does do what the camera so-called ought to be doing yeah. by that point in our art history. Um, I wonder how at the time in the 60s this kind of painting was really received. You know, was there an expectation in the 60s that painting, you know, we come through abstract expressionism, especially in the States, you know, all the different, again, ways of painting even if this is seen at all as something unusual or maverick at its time? Um, That's a good question. I don't know the answer. It's interesting too, because at the same, around the same time in the early seventies too, he started playing with all of that actual photo montage where he was taking pictures, piles of pictures and merging them together into like one image, you know? Yeah. I mean, photography so he was kind of going both, he was going both directions at the same time, you know? Absolutely. And then I don't think I really know anybody else off the top of my head right now who I can think of that so um, cleverly diversifies, but actually from quite a narrow start point, which in Hockney's case does tend to be actually quite photographic. Again, this idea, as you say, of photo joiners, um, and as I've described, this sort of photographic sense or sensibility in the splash. Mm. And then, of course, later, when he comes to make work like this, which is from his iPad series. Um, which is interesting. Do you think that, do you like this work? I, I've come to like it because it's familiar to me, but I don't think I like it. I don't it's think it's fami familiar it. to you because you've seen it multiple times. Yeah, and we use it a lot at school. It. I mean, I've seen people make work on iPads that, well, listen, Hockney is an interesting case study because he is, he's never been a particularly skilled 
painter in the sense that like, I mean, he's a skilled painter, but he's not, he's not a, he's not some sort of perfectionist, photorealistic, you know, high end guy is his technique and whatnot. So if he's doing something on a, on an iPad, to me, it feels a little just sort of like he's messing around for five minutes and then he says, oh yeah, that's done. See, I, I don't agree with you there. I think the Hockney is actually a very skilled painter. I think his painting, again, this idea of, you know, time and, and circumstance and context, it, he is painting in a way that demonstrates uh, a keen awareness of, um, I, I guess, material, material limitation. With the iPad drawings and paintings, we're seeing somebody who is adapting to new technologies that doesn't mean it's any good. However, uh, whether they're good or not enters that sort of subjective domain that's, again, not really to do with whether someone is actually technically proficient or not, whether it's just... Sure. Like looking but I think them. even going back, I mean, I don't think that... I never look at Hockney paintings and think, oh, there is a master of his craft. I think he makes interesting things, but I don't think of him in the same way that I think of, you know... It's interesting because I've seen people do artwork on digital screens on iPads and things that I thought actually were, you wouldn't even know that they were made on that medium. He definitely makes work that looks like it was made on that medium. <laughs> but you could say that Van Gogh looks like he's put paint on with his spatula or his thick head brush, you know? Yeah. I feel like this is the kind of thing that I would do with an iPad and I'm a terrible artist. Hmm. I think that's very splotchy to me. That really raises a question, and it's a question that pushes forward actually with the other things we're going to look at in a moment. Obviously, there's the age old debate about what actually is art. Mm -hmm. I think what's becoming more and more um, interesting, but also important to discuss, is who is the artist? Especially now, more than ever, like who is an artist? What is an artist? what qualifies yeah. who or what an artist is or might be because and at art, a certain point does that word not mean anything well art as you and i often discuss can be anything to anyone now you mm -hmm. you don't like that no nope. that to me seems quite brilliant <laughs> but i do come up against a different feeling when i think about anybody being an artist and I, I question whether I'm actually a closet elitist in some way because I feel that art ought to be made by an artist and when I go into what then I think an artist must be an artist absolutely must be human why exactly why and that's why we're talking about this and what we're looking at tonight I, I want to investigate and scrutinize my bias and I also want to unpick and inquire into my prejudices around this because it seems most ridiculous in 2023 that I should be sitting here especially as an art educator having such a limited view of what an artist or who an artist is sure I mean in at least from a in a legal sense in America I don't know what it's like in 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 the UK, I mean, mm. you people, you know, in your laws, um, you people, <laughs> uh, you, you, um, you have to be a human in order to copyright works of art, right? Mm. Um, it can't be generated. It can't be made by a non-human, like the monkey picture of many years ago that everyone talked about, you know, the one. Monkey got his hands on a camera, turned it around, took a picture of himself, and the mm -hmm. photographer was like, this is my picture. And the court was like, no, it's not. It's that monkey's picture. But that monkey can't copyright it, so this thing is in the public domain. Um, so there are certain lines that have been drawn from a legal standpoint of like who is allowed to be an artist and what being an artist means. My problem with opening up the definition too much is that it means that everyone is an artist, which means that it really doesn't have any meaning at all. And that's my problem with art. You're but just one also, step. There's a kind of retrospective quality to defining who an artist is, isn't there? In that, you know, we come forward a bit in time from where somebody makes something. And then we uh, layer on our kind of cultural values from the moment 
or the point from which we we view and so for example someone someone like Vincent van Gogh during his lifetime not credited with making anything of any value and yet later becoming one of the most famous celebrated uh painters ever sure. uh, you know our position to art changes how we perceive the artist right. People say that, you know, some dance or piece of music, well, that's not music, that's whatever. And then 50 years later, it's the predominant music, right? Yeah, and I mean, there, there's no question that at the time what he was making this, for example, he was considered an artist, absolutely. Yep. But nonetheless, I wonder how much he was really pushing the envelope. He was pushing the envelope with this. And actually, yes, someone but... like Hockney is, as you said, a good case study, because in his very long life, he has had the capacity to adapt to a changing art landscape. Wait, why, uh, what, what, what was pushed on the iPad one? The fact that he used an iPad to draw? Yes, and also that he, I, I guess it's a bit iteration of the same kind of form. You know, you said before, you know, using a digital tool is using a tool nonetheless in the way that we might use a paintbrush and it can be held in our hand with bristles on its end, or it could be at our fingertips on a flat, shiny, smooth screen where we move our fingers about or an eye, a, sure. an eye pencil. It's yeah. a tool and it's being used and it's being operated by a human. Again, this is where I come in with my feelings about human making art. But, you know, well, I can't remember where I'm going with this, but um, in Hockney's case, the iPad drawings, they push the envelope simply because here is again, this idea of celebrated artist. Here are these grand institutions in which, you know, the finest paintings and pieces of sculpture hang and are exhibited. And Hockney's putting iPad drawings that as you yourself say, you could make as somebody who doesn't credit themselves with any skill in that area. But I don't, I don't say that because I think iPad drawings by definition have a problem with them. I just don't think his iPad drawings are particularly good, right? I'm just, I, I'm not disagreeing but with you. Also, just, don't forget, just, at the time, in 2010... This was very early on. It was, it was early, you know? Sure. Anyway. I'm finding all of this very complicated. It's a complicated it's, topic. It's complicated because when I look at this, right, this piece of work, Eternity, uh, was exhibited in the Louvre in, two, in 2021. I don't know if it's still there yeah. actually. The Louvre, again, fine establishment institution. Uh, tourists flock there, art enthusiasts, you know. Camp it's in the Louvre, there. it has to be art. Yeah. Right. So, in amongst the Berninis is this by Yuki Morita. It's called Eternity. It is actually a three dimensional object. So, as such, yeah. perhaps its relationship with the digital is kind of oblique until one finds out that Yuki Morita uses a particular tool called ZBrush. Okay. The long discussion yesterday, whether it's- So is it, was it 3D yeah. printed? Well, it, it kind of is ZBrush. I've actually got a description coming up in a minute of what it is that I took yeah. from the ZBrush web website because I hadn't heard of it before. I've heard of other ways that, you know, AI generates art, obviously Dali and Midjourney, people are talking about that all the time. In fact, that's become kind of old hat now. Everybody knows those uh, names. But ZBrush I had not heard of. We have a 3D printer at school. I think I can mostly get my head around its kind of application. Uh, but when I heard of this, and I thought again about my biases and my preconceived ideas about what belongs in the canon of art and who is again the artist this really struck me so Morita got to exhibit at the Louvre because uh, they were exhibiting I think a kind of not comic con but like a fantasy art and VR conference Right. And, and I think somebody from the Louvre saw the work and loved it. If you go on Morita's website, you can see lots of examples of what I think of as fantasy or, or gaming art. Okay. 
you know, skilled, uh, sure. interesting to look at, so on. Yep. What bothers you about it? Uh, hang on. Stop rushing. Okay. Just look for a minute. I, I know this is a very poor way of looking because we're looking on a screen. You and I are very far apart. We should really be standing looking at it in the Louvre, scrutinizing it and having this conversation. Well, meet you there next Thursday. We'll go take a look. <laughs> this is what it says. ZBrushes. Zebra sets the industry standard for digital sculpting and painting. Its features enable you to use customizable brushes to shape, texture, and paint virtual clay in a real-time environment that provides instant feedback. That's the first sticking point for me. When you use ZBrush, you'll be empowered by the same tools employed by artists the world over. In fact, we have even received an Academy Award for the technology that powers ZBrush. In short, ZBrush is an art tool created by artists for artists. It allows you to create models and illustrations limited only by your imagination at a speed that allows you to stand out in today's fast paced industry. That's my second sticking point. Now, oh, wait, so wait, now, hold on a second. So it's just so I understand this. What this basically is, is a brush that works in three dimensions so that you can be inside of a 3D space and manipulate objects in 3D space. So you're basically just virtually doing things in three dimensions to create this thing that she then theoretically 3D printed and, and is now in the Louvre? Yes, but the thing that sticks with me is yep. this bit where it provides instant feedback. Now, I Why is that bad? Mean, well, I want to know what that really means. It in probably that, means that computers are fast enough now to keep up with somebody's hand to do it in three dimensions. Because that's a right. very complicated thing to do. Does that also mean, though, that the tool itself is self-enhancing? No, I wouldn't think so. I think what it means is that you're now working with a tool that when you pull or stretch or cut or slice or whatever, however you manipulate the objects in 3D space you can actually see it doing it in real time and don't have to wait for it to render. That would be what I would say that would mean. So then the second thing I come to is, is also about speed. Sure. Which is about the speed or the work emerging at a speed that allows you to stand out in today's fast paced industry. I'm wondering here about how I perceive the reward of time. In well, craft. hold up there, sister. Uh, you know, it was the Impressionists who started using tubed paint, which made them incredibly fast compared to other people because they could just go somewhere with seven colors and, and make art, right? Right. And that was considered, oh, you don't, you don't crush your own, you don't make your own paint. You're not a real artist, right? I mean, that was, that was the argument then. So isn't well, it just that further well, now? I know it, but I, I know within myself this resistance I'm having to it. And what is interesting to me is, as you suggest, I know about the, um, throughout history, these kind of moments at which things emerge that fundamentally alter the course sure. of art history specifically, such as you've described mm -hmm. the Impressionist using tubed paint the, or digital uh, photography or yeah <laughs> the person lugging a camera or indeed i know person. something about digital photography sure yeah right yeah this i just i'm really struggling i think to come to terms with what was interesting for me is speaking to students at school about this a level students they also really struggled with this and i spoke about this with fine art students who spend hours learning to oil paint for example sure and or working in clay with their hands their thoughts on this was that this is actually quite terrifying now there's all kinds of things buzzing about in my mind about these kinds of uh questions these contemporary conundrums about almost like the morality of art making wait wait hold um, on can i interject just for one second that is is the argument though that making art should be hard. It shouldn't be easy. There shouldn't be shortcuts that, that, that 
there is some, it feels like there's some level of elitism in just having the time or skill to do something and anything that makes it easier and democratizing it is lessening the value of artists. Yes, but isn't it fascinating what's happening here? Because really it appears to be that here I am being the one of the two of us, as you like to categorize us all the time. I'm the one of the two of us who actually quite likes that art is available to everyone and by everyone. And yet here we are talking in a way that reveals my innate or maybe latent elitism, because I seem to have a hang up about kind of the suffering of one's or suffering for one's art or craft. Whereas here you I, are, I, and you don't yeah. like the notion that actually art could be anything or by anyone, yet you're the one talking about the democratization of art and, and kind of championing that, it seems. Mm -hmm. Now, there's there's no position in this, Bill, and actually I don't say- No, but I, but I'm but it's funny because like, I'm, not, I'm, I'm championing it in the sense that I'm just trying to understand the contours of your argument. I agree with you. Art. Anything that makes my thing easier to do makes it more doable by other people, in which case I am less special, in which case you get to the point where anyone can do anything because it's not about having the skill to paint. You just have to have an idea of what to paint and the machine will paint it for you. Well, you didn't paint anything. Well, so tell me how you feel about that. I don't like it, personally. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't like it as somebody who, you know, makes a living doing it. Right. Right. And yet if, here if, we if, are looking at a tool um, description that implies. Interestingly enough, this to me, Z, Z, ZBrush to me, though, the way it's described here seems like a very specialized tool for somebody who really has to know how to do those things. I don't think someone who doesn't know anything about this could pick up the tools in ZBrush and actually make anything useful. I think that it's sort of like a digital version of, for example, I can't draw. If I pull up my iPad and my pencil, I, my Apple pencil, I still can't draw. My friend Gideon is a world-class illustrator. He can draw like the Dickens on an iPad, you know? So it's, it's. Okay. There are two things that I just want to interject here that um, Marita sure. themselves said. One yep. is that, they, they uh, disclose that they were not trained formally as an artist. Okay. So I assume that means they didn't go to art school, but essentially right. they've, learned, they've, learned I, their, so yeah. they've learned their craft on the job sure. and in the VR industry. And then the next thing is this, they say, Unlike traditional art, digital tools such as ZBrush allow me to focus on visual creation and modeling without having to think about anything physical. Yep. Now, in that, again, I sort of find a problem. The lack of limitations in the material. I find a lack of limitation in the material problematic for the reasons we've already discussed, but I also find it most bizarre that somebody would make something that ultimately is a three-dimensional form where they're not thinking about something physical. Now, these are the limitations of my thinking. And when you call it an argument, I'm not really having an argument. I'm just ruminating. I'm just going about yeah, I, I didn't mean argument in a uh, aggressive sense. I just mean like just trying to understand your thinking. Yeah. Of course you meant it in an aggressive sense. You're American. Um, I would just like to kind of go into this with you a bit. Sure. Because I, I want to try and discover how I feel about it. Well, you, um, you're a woman, you're a woman who used to print in a dark room, used to print color in dark room. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like taking a digital photograph and doing an inkjet print of it is somehow a cheap version of a print? Kind of. Okay. Yeah. Or rather, it's just a different thing. The similar yeah. thing from the point of view of making the photograph in its instant, but the process of bringing that thing to life for others to consume, that's different. Yet I know that um, the things that I might have done in an analog way in a colour dark room are then the things that can be done 
simply on a computer screen. You know, I, I'm interpreting color balances. I'm interpreting nuances of hue. Well, of course, that same thing can be done just with different keys. So I, I've come to terms with that. Sure. Uh, but this is still very fresh for me. By the way, all of this also comes about because I just about had my brain fried talking about chat GPT the other day and realizing in this kind of epiphany moment, this kind of enlightenment insight uh, that I'm actually now entirely obsolete as an educator yep. who teaches critical thinking in art history, essay writing, Welcome to the club. What's the point of me? I'm well, <laughs> you know, it's funny. It's funny. My my friend Gideon said to me the other day, we were we were talking about this stuff, and 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 we were talking about all these generative art things for illustration, right? Which is almost the worst of all of them. Mm. Yeah. Um, and he, you know, basically he said the old adage of you know they said that all of the computers were going to automate all of the drudgery so that we could all sit around making art. And now they're just making computers that are taking the art away from us. So like what's left of humanity? Like, what are we doing here? Well, what um, is left for us? Now, you know, we are giving our capacities over. What kind of, what's capacities? What does that mean? Our, our who's giving them? The people who create programs where human capabilities are kind of nullified, they're brought to zero. The thing is, is that most, the AI stuff, including this photograph or the chat GPT writing stuff that you're talking about, at least right now, those things aren't actually thinking, they're not actually making anything. What they're doing is going in the stew of everything that humans have ever made and cutting and pasting and plopping things together. Right, I know, but you know, you have a- They're making a bad amalgam of what we make, you know? Are they making a bad amalgam? I mean, th this is exactly- Well, they're making an amalgam. That's not necessarily bad, but- No, right. Yeah. So this is what exactly happened to me the other night. I was sitting in the, in the pub with David on Sunday night, and he said to me about chat GPT and that he was- finding out a lot about it and reading a lot. And I, I was curious. I didn't really know anything about it. Stupidly, shame on me, because the more he described to me what it was and then showed me, yeah. the more I realized- Write me an essay that, about Picasso and how right, cubism so changed I did art. exactly that. So yeah. I knew from, from what had been explained <laughs> to me that it has, you know, basically everything on the internet at its fingertips pre-2021. But I thought to myself, surely, you know, I, I teach uh, A-level students to write personal studies uh, that have to be really nuanced and the use of language is very personal to them. It's blah, 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 blah. So I thought, what, what have I been doing recently? So I, I asked Chat GPT to write a comparison between uh, Pablo Picasso and Constantin Brancusi based on their personalities. So not just their art outcomes, but their personalities. So I thought that that, that might be would, a bit- Would, would, would trip it up. <laughs> oh my and, God. And I'm my so guess is it did stupid. a great job. Oh my God, the thing it wrote, I'm, I'm a good writer, right? <laughs> but my goodness, uh, I read this thing and I just thought, I might as well not go to work tomorrow. The thing is that all of that was pulled from other people who have written about it in the past. Right. That but, wasn't synthesizing something out no, of nothing. No, everything about it. And again, this is going back to this idea of like ZBrush describing itself as something that's so speedy and that that in itself is some kind of amazing thing, a thing to be. Well, it is a tool for commercial artists. So I. Right. You know. Okay. But it, it's really, um, I don't know if the right term would be monetizing or sure. making currency in a, in a different way out of. Hasn't there always, hasn't, isn't that the dirty secret of artists that like when it comes right down to it, it's about the Medici's giving you enough money to buy wine so that you can still paint. Right. The question is just at what point 
Is it that if CVS needs pictures for its new campaign and it wants a bunch of twins, it can just ask a generative art thing to do it. And it won't hire any sort of human artist to do it because it's just not worth it to them. Um, that, that the stuff that's on the screen now, you called yep. a photograph. Well, it's photographic, but yes. Yeah, it's not a photograph, is it? Right. It's, it's a photographic a photograph. amalgamation, yes. Um, I would urge everybody to go and look at Katsuko Koiso online. Absolutely amazing work. Uh, you know, it, it is this of, work? Is this is this their work? Well, this is what we're looking at, isn't it? Like, where are our, where right. is our tolerance? What is our tolerance to this? As yeah, art? you 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 asked ChatGPT to write that essay. Is that your essay? This is what we're looking at, isn't it? And I have no. Yeah, answer. but where do you come down? Well, I have no answers yet. I'm still too, I'm too busy wading through my, as I said earlier, my prejudices, my, uh, you know, my preconceived ideas about what art is. I need to stop being such a dinosaur. I'm aware of that. But beyond that, when I get over myself a little bit, I then still, I think, need to address if there is, again, this sort of, uh, you know, the morality of making, uh, who, who gets to be an artist what is the qualification and I have to be so careful with that because I might be you know coming undone because nothing I'm saying adds up because it's all jumbled all different my viewpoints don't tally within my own viewpoints and that's what's really perplexing me about all of this I suppose is that there's not for me, certainly, there's not one straight line of navigation through it. Uh, there is no straight line. I think it's because it it upends the your initial problem, which was trying to define what an artist is mm -hmm. and what art is when you and I have talked about it in the past. It becomes so inclusive that the definition changes. And when that oh. definition changes, like what was the original def? How does the original definition fit into the new gen definition? Right. So I started tonight by asking you, you know, what what is like a kind of pivot point in art history or emerging art culture? I think so, the next five years is the biggest since the origin of art. Right. Okay. So is is this really it? Are we actually at that point now? Or will we, as a society, because this is something so new, yes, commercial artists, blah, blah, blah. Ultimately, this is all pulling from what people make. It can't make, at least so far, it's not making anything that isn't a mishmash of what humans have made already. So humans are still required in this to make the original material. The problem is that they, if you can't eat by making those original materials or probably make less of those original materials. But I wonder if as society, we will make a distinction between this was made by a person and this was made by a machine and but the machine stuff no. just won't have value in some way. In the same way that a photograph is generally less valuable than a painting because it was so much easier to make. The value of it is less. I don't know. I'm just, I'm hypothesizing. Mm. You know, it's it's sort of like this was a this was a diamond made in a lab. It's not as good as a diamond that was pulled out of the ground. Like these are distinctions that are made about things, and it changes their value in society. I don't agree necessarily that it should. If I was not somebody who makes art, the problem is I don't know whose life all of this won't touch. This will affect lawyers. This will affect artists. This yeah. will affect playwrights. This will affect grant writers. Somebody I was reading, I was listening to a podcast today and somebody was talking about a friend of theirs who just has ChatGPT write grant applications that she just sends out dozens a day. So if you're just gaming what was supposed to be a personal thing like you were saying, okay, well, what if what happens when everyone starts gaming and instead of getting 150 submissions, they get 440,000 submissions? Because everyone really, just auto wrote I, something. Does that not suggest that what will happen ultimately is that any human endeavor is scrapped and that what we once would have 
made or written. Uh, a new tool has to be devised, I don't know, to detect. It's almost like detection of life, isn't it? Sure. It's but, like what, but what what is the alternative? Do you, do you think that the people who make these tools should decide not to make them? Because they all are they are arguably very useful in many ways, right? How are, how are they useful though? This is something. I mean, that argument is used all the time. But how are they? I mean, it's simply by speeding up processes. Sure. Uh, you know, are we so? Uh, <laughs> Well, this is a very Luddite statement of like, don't we have everything we need today already? We don't need anything more. It's just so greedy, isn't it? Like this is Well, I mean, yes, but like in the 1950s, I would have really, you know, loved to have chemotherapy if I had cancer. Right. Know? Okay, but and gene um, therapies and all these other things. So like, you know, is it tough. short sighted of me then to to not believe that there is some upside? Mm. Yeah. I don't know. I'm suspicious, Bill. I mean, the the one advantage that say, if you were somebody who say makes lifestyle photographs, you know, I need a picture of a family eating hamburgers in their backyard for a you know a ketchup commercial or whatever it is, I would be screwed because you could literally just tell them the backyard you want and whatever it is, and this thing will make you that. The one advantage I have is if somebody says, I need a photograph, a portrait of Sandy Robertson. That is less easy to do unless I guess it, it could go grab a bunch of pictures of you and make some weird amalgamation, you know, some illustrated version of you, some weird new photographic version of you. Well, you're but ultimately, the person who's made and published photographs as me, as, of me as far as I know. Well, then they're going to take my pictures and, you know, do all <laughs> kinds of terrible things with them. I don't know. I mean, these are these are the questions I have. I mean, um, uh, my relative TJ sent me this actually this these articles about this stuff today, and asking me what I thought. And I was like, Are, are you not know. noticing also a massive acceleration in chat about this? Like, I, I know that in the last week, really, since I've started to get my teeth into the chat GPT stuff. Sure. Uh, that I've, I mean, it's like saying you have a red car and then suddenly you see red cars, but I have honestly, a, a friend sent me a message earlier, even saying, since I'd spoken to her yesterday about it, she's heard another two people talking about it. Whereas before sure. like, there's been, there's been actually scarily, uh, as educators for us in school, uh, there's been a silence about it. I almost feel it's worthy of like a public service announcement, like a kind of government intervention where somebody announces, you know, I know that um, universities, for example, are starting to actually write into their, um, you know, you know the, syllabi the, and moral the, things that you can't use these you know, tools. Yeah. No, but you can. They're all saying that you can, as long as you cite oh. it. Uh, and I spoke I mean, to someone who was telling me that his brother doing his degree is using it all the time to write his essays and assignments. Why? What is that about? I mean, is that- well, then awful? you're not actually doing anything. It, I mean, but is that, is it allowed because universities simply don't want to have to deal with the massive problem of sifting out what they believe somebody to have- There, are, there are tools that can read things that actually are supposedly able to pick these things out. But then there are other tools that specifically write stuff through generative AI that is is good enough or is written in a certain way as to beat those tools. Right. So now so, you're in an arms race, right? I mean, I mean, the most basic thing I've ever been able to do really for um, checking essays is simply to try and determine whether a student has plagiarized it from somewhere or, you know, is it, is it sure. something that is original writing? Uh, I can't do that. I mean, another friend said to me, oh, yes, like you've just suggested, yes, there'll be a program somewhere that you will be able to. There are, there are tools already. Right. Yeah. But again, as you just said, then tool combats tool, digital combats digital. Yep. Digital sure. avalanche is happening now. Yep, yep. It's going to snowball in a way that it seems to me will be kind of catastrophic for most creative industries uh, uh, so welcome, welcome to the party i've been living in for the last couple of years yeah 
this is honestly like this, this, this is what goes on in my thoughts as I go to sleep at night. The thing is that I don't, I don't think anyone in any industry is safe unless you're literally mining coal. <laughs> and then at a certain point, it's like, well, if there's no work for anyone to do, because all these things have taken over, not only just manufacturing, but also whatever it is, then how is anybody going to have enough money? Well, then you're talking about, you know, base income for people and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, okay, well, then, you know, well, who's paying those taxes? Well, rich people, well, he, it is it is a shift in society bigger than we've seen since at least the industrial revolution mm. I mean, this is sort of this order yeah the beginning of the internet was just a prelude to this stuff now what happens when we don't just have regenerative ais we actually have ais in the next 10 or 15 years that actually are you know genuine general artificial general intelligence you know which is basically like things that actually can think and come up with ideas and you don't need to pay and can work 24 hours a day and don't need to sleep and are a thousand times faster than you and they're good enough to design better versions of themselves which design better versions of themselves which i'm you know and that's the singularity go read ray kurzweil and you'll get deep into that but yeah it's scary oh wow I'm going to go to bed now and have sweet dreams. Thank you, Sandy. Well, that's it. Thank you. Well, at least, you know, until the AI is replaced, speaking of seeing with two virtual versions of us. <laughs> Bye, Bill. Bye, Sandy. <laughs>